Hey guys, and welcome to my recap of day one of the 2021 FIDE World Cup. Now, for those of you who are wondering what exactly is the FIDE World Cup, well, I have a little introduction that will explain why this tournament is one of the biggest chess tournaments of 2021. Sound cool? Let's uh, see some of the details. So this is the Wikipedia article, which will also allow me to show you the results from day one of the play to see some of the upsets and some of the players who are playing in this tournament. For those who follow other sports like tennis, the FIDE Chess World Cup basically has the same format as the Wimbledon in it. It's a single elimination tournament. So that means that the players are seeded and they play matches against one another. And then the winner of that match goes on to the next round of the knockout and the player that loses, well, they are eliminated from the tournament. But as you can see here, they do get a nice prize where we can see, for example, the players are eliminated in round one, that they get, you know, 3,750 US dollars for, uh, for basically showing up and playing. So not a bad payday in that sense. And of course, this being day one, this is the first day of round one. Just so you can understand a bit more of the format, for those of you who are too lazy to read, what it basically means is that for each of these knockout matches, they will play two classical games, that is uh, two players in a given knockout match. If that match is tied 1-all, then they play two rapid chess games. If that's still tied 1-1, they play two more rapid games, but a bit faster rapid chess. If those are still tied 1-1, then they will play two more blitz games. And if those two blitz games are still tied, meaning the match would be 4-4, the way in which they determine a winner is to play one single game known as an Armageddon game, sort of like a known tiebreaker when two players just can't get the better of one another. And what that means is that they play one game where black gets draw odds. That means if black draws the game, they will win the match and move on to the next round. But in return, white gets a bit more time than black does on the clock where white receives five minutes and is in a must-win situation. Black has it four minutes for the game, but they get the draw odds that a draw will allow them to advance to the next round. And as you can see here, they also get an extra two seconds per move, beginning at move 61 for the Armageddon game. That's just to make sure that the black play just doesn't get flagged in some way, uh, you know, in some, let's say, dead winning position or in some dead drawn position. So it makes it a relatively fair uh, game in that sense. Uh, where one player's not going to have some massive advantage just because they were white or just because they were black. Um, so that's a bit about it. And obviously, as you know, the first day of round one was played. And the reason this tournament is very important, which I'm sure you guys have been wondering about from my intro, is that basically the FIDE World Cup is a tournament that's used to determine who is going to go through to the candidates, which is the next stage of the World Championship cycle. So that means that the two finalists from this list of players, which I've just brought up here, the two finalists are going to qualify for the candidates. And of course, the player that wins the candidates goes on to challenge a reigning world champion, who at the time of recording this is Magnus Carlsen, uh, in a match for the world chess title. So if you're wondering how did Ian Napomnesi then get to challenge Magnus Carlsen in the world chess championship of 2021, well, it's because he won the candidates and the World Cup, well, as we know, is one of the ways to qualify for the candidates. And we can see here that it's a pretty star-studded field that we even have Magnus Carlsen playing in the tournament. So you might be wondering, well, since Carlsen obviously can't play in the candidates because he's the world champion, what happens if Carlsen is one of the two finalists? And so the answer is that then the winner of third place will end up being the one qualifying along with, you know, first or second, whoever is left over other than Magnus Carlsen from the tournament. Um, so yeah, that's basically, you can see not just Carlson, Caruana, but also Aronian, Giri, Grishuk, Mamadjarov, MVL, Ferruja, Dominguez, Kayakin. A lot of very high-level names and obviously a lot more Grandmasters rated. Over 2,700. And we can see there are a total of 25 Grandmasters rated over 2,700 in this tournament. I think Alexienko might actually have a live rating over 2,900 FIDE. And I know Fedosev does as well. Um, so yeah, you can see it's roughly... 26 players rate over 2,700 who are playing in uh, in this tournament. Uh, you can see that the seedings are based on the FIDE ranks of June 2021. That's so the players had a couple of weeks in order to be able to prepare for their uh, their opponents and basically prepare in the best possible way for the tournament. 
I can see there are a lot of other players as well. You, know, you can see that the lowest rate play, rate players are still you know right around this like two thousand to two three hundred ish, two four hundred ish kind of level. So you can see that yeah, while there's a big difference between the highest rate played and the lowest rated, obviously with half of the field being eliminated each round, that does mean that the pairings are going to get tougher and tougher with each round that you get through. Um, so anyway, that's my sort of introduction, and you can see some details here about how the different players qualified for the event, if that's something that interests you, but that's not something I'm going to get into here, because after all, you guys want to see the results. This is a recap video after all. Uh, we also can see here there are a lot of players that didn't make the tournament, and the reason was because of obviously COVID. It means that, well, it's much harder to be able to travel, especially if you're in a country that is very adversely effect affected by COVID. So you can see that some of the players were replaced by other participants in this field here. Okay, now let's get to the results. And I want to quickly explain something about the results as well, because there are a few things here that might not make sense if you're not familiar with uh, the tournament format and with the way that these sort of tournaments work from past experience. So what this means is we can see, for example, that Magnus Carlsen says WO for walkover. And what that means is that basically Carlsen is already seeded into the second round by virtue of being one of the top seeds. I've got exactly what the number is. I think the top, uh, well, it's something I can always check like exactly how many players have been seeded into round two automatically. Uh, if I move up a little bit and see the uh, the details, I think it should be written here, uh, written here somewhere you would think, but uh, maybe not, or maybe I'm just completely blind and missing it. But yeah, there's a set number of players who are basically qualified already into the second round by virtue of being one of the highest rated players. And of course, Magnus Carlsen being the top seed of the tournament, well, is obviously seeded. But we have some other matches as well where, you know, this is a chance where if you want to see if your favorite player, you know, won his game or whether they lost or whether it was a draw, well, this will show you that. So we can see that, you know, there was this very balanced match where Martinovic from Croatia managed to beat the Australian player Kolaps. Barev, who actually Barev used to be a top uh, a top player in the world representing Russia, but then he moved to Canada and you can see he beat a much lower seed in Daniel Kizon. If you're wondering about the rating range of these players, basically the highest rated player who's playing in round one who hasn't automatically qualified to round two is rated about 2645. I think it's Ivan Saric, if I remember correctly, but don't quote me on that. You know, you can see Aryan Tari, the you know, Norwegian uh, young grandmaster beating Daniel Barish. Uh, Alexeyev and Falsi drew their game. Gratarsen and Stupak had a draw. So even though there's a rating difference, I think the difference is probably about 100 rating points. So a draw is not that big of a shock uh, for this match. You can see players like Matlakov and Dubov already qualified, so I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, Gukesh and Teklaf uh, drew their game. And again, you can see that the closer the seedings are, that the closer they are in rating. And so the average rating, I think, is... Well, not average, but the median rating is basically 2548. So that means if they're a higher seed, they're rated above 2548. And if they're a lower seed, they're rated below 2548 is a, an easy way to keep it in mind. You can see Vokaturo beat, it, uh, beat Gan Erdin. I think he qualified, Gan Erdin qualified from the, uh, if I remember correctly, some Asian continental. We had some really fantastic tournament and qualified in that way. Uh, Malakov had a, uh, qualifies to the next round and so does Abasov. Uh, Shagshan beat uh, Martinez Reyes, uh, Nguyen beat uh, Kozak, and also, well, now we get to see some of the other sections. There are a total of 16 sections, so it'll take a little bit of time, but it'll also allow you to see some of the different upsets as well that happen, and, well, Section 3 actually had quite a few upsets here. We can see that Pant Suleya, well, lost his game to Vakidov. It's not a huge upset, there's only a 30 point rating difference, but it still counts, and that's a game that we might have a look at as well if we've got time. You know, I will be showing some of the games I consider to be highlights from the tournament. This one between Pontrakov against Sousa, that's one I'm definitely going to be showing you guys, because Sousa actually had a winning position at the time when he agreed to draw. Uh, Kuzbov beat Cassis, so you see a big rating difference there. And another upset where the English I am, Ravi Haria, who I think recently wrote a book actually on the anti-Sicilians for White for Thinkers Publishing. He had a nice win against the creative uh, Russian GM Vadim Sagansev. So a very nice upset win for him. Uh, Gabusian beat uh, Belasine from Algeria. Uh, we see Palagras and Ruska had a draw. Again, there'd be a mild upset. Uh, Purin beat uh, the 
young Russian player Makarian, uh, Corey beat uh, Karimov, Mareko beat Kader, Sindarov drew with Tang in a very long game, and while well, this uh, game actually in between two very uh, relatively young players, I think Tang is not even 20 uh, at this stage, and Sindarov obviously one of the youngest grandmasters of all time, I think getting a title at, I forget whether it was 12 years or 13 years, but it was like very close to this like 13 year old uh, age, as it were. So, as for some other games, well, we see Ponser and Nikolov drew their game, very close rating. Uh, Pichot beat uh, Minero Pineda, uh, and then Saric won against uh, Miguel. Uh, also, we see Villagra beating, uh, uh, wait, beating Kevin Go. Actually, I think there was a game that Kevin Go is actually much better at some point. We had a quick look. But anyway, it looks like uh, the higher ed play did win this one. Uh, Georgiev beat uh, Zebu- uh, Zebuadza. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but maybe you guys can correct me in the chat uh, so like, we can all learn something. Uh, also, Bogna lost to Indian, the uh, promising uh, Indian player. I think it's not that big of an upset. I think probably only a 70 to 80 rating point difference. But yeah, it's still obviously a great result for the Indian player. So good job. Uh, Dani beat uh, Rahman. Uh, Sevian beat Subramanian. In another game, there's quite a bit of an upset. Bok drew against Abjapa. Uh, one thing that's worth pointing out when it comes to the tournament strategy with uh, with these tournaments is that basically because you're playing a match, it means that there's only two games for each section, right? So that means one loss can be particularly fatal. Like, let's say if you lost with the black pieces, well, you still have a chance to try to win with white and use that first move advantage to come back. But if you lost with the white pieces, then it would be very hard to recover from that because you need to win with black. And at the grandmaster level, it's much harder to win a game with black than it is to win a game with white against a given opponent. We can see another upset here where Guillermo Vasquez, who I think is an international master, if I remember correctly, and I think also a very strong crazy house player. He won against uh, Nikita Meshkovs, so a nice result for him. We see uh, Fear and Petrak uh, drew their game. Actually, the story of how Petrak qualified for this FIDE World Cup is very interesting because quite a lot of, well, not a lot, but there are some FIDE wild cards that are awarded. So what I do is at FIDE will award to some players who didn't qualify for the tournament by normal means, but who they feel deserve to be in the tournament. And they gave Petrak one for fair play because he had a game against Gelfand in some European qualifier event for the World Cup. Well, Gelfand made a mouse slip and put his queen on pre in a critical game. Like this was the second game where basically whoever wins that game goes on to win the, uh, to win the spot for the World Cup or rather at least advance the next round of qualification for the World Cup, but instead of taking the free queen, Petrak actually offered a draw, which Gelfand accepted, so showing this sort of kind of fair play, uh, Fide decided to award him this spot in the in the tournament, so he got rewarded for his, uh, you know, I guess his generosity in that regard. Uh, we see also Delgado Ramirez beating Merced, Adi Ban beating Chipanga, so these results not huge shocks, but okay, this game between Akobian against Kiseno, that game was a draw, so a bit of an upset result there. And I also want to talk a little bit about this sort of walkover where, again, you're probably wondering, well, why is it that Mikulevsky walked over against his opponent whose name is shown here? And the reason is I think his opponent wasn't able to make the tournament, and I'm not going to say for absolutely certain why, but I think that for most of these players, it's probably because of COVID that they weren't able to get their visas in time, or maybe there was some lockdown in their country that didn't allow them to basically travel to get to the FIDE World Cup. So that sort of explains some of these walkovers that you're going to see here. Moving on to section 8, we can see that Yakubo have beat uh, Pro 2. Uh, Dura Bailey had a draw with Skylarov, so a small upset because a difference in rank of about like 130, 140 points there. So a good result for the Finnish IM. Uh, Chifran Aravind beat uh, Concio. Uh, Abdu Satorov, you can see he had a walkover against Mohamed Erian. I guess he wasn't able to travel to the tournament. Uh, Doing a balanced game on reigning, Savchenko and Afanasiev drew. It's kind of funny, I'd almost forgotten actually about this guy, uh, Afanasyev. Because I remember a few years ago when I was following the chess players very closely, I thought, oh, I know the name of every single Grandmaster. Which was a bit cocky of me, because there were some I still didn't know. Uh, we can see for the Australian representative, we have uh, Bobby Cheng drawing with uh, Sanal. That was a game I saw was quite balanced, and definitely a, a good start, given that Bobby was black in that game. Uh, Kovalev beat uh, Makoto. Serana beat Ajibola. Uh, in a game, it's a small upset. Gareev drew with Jing Yao, or Tin Jing Yao. And actually, this is... Uh, I remember that the way that Tin Jing Yao qualified for this event was he had a really 
standout performance in Asian Continental Tournament just a few months ago, and that was what allowed him to qualify for the event. Okay, I think it's the first time they have two Singaporeans in the World Cup, so obviously a very good sign for Singaporean chess. Uh, Buckman beat uh, Shubin. Uh, we can see some other results in Section 10 that Ivic beat, Hung or rather drew with Hungaski. Erdish had a walkover, so forfeit win over Atabayev uh, from Turkmenistan, I believe. Uh, Stugirov beat Prudente. Because actually, uh, Temur Kubakarov from uh, Australia was meant to be playing on this uh, in this tournament, but he wasn't able to get to the tournament because like COVID and you know lockdown mean he wasn't able to get from Perth to Sochi, as it were. So therefore, Prudente, who also played in the same zonal that uh, Kubakarov qualified from, took his spot. So that's why he is uh, he is playing here. Yeah, it almost reminds me of 2019, actually, when I won the zonal spot for the uh, FIDE World Cup uh, of 2019. But because I'd already retired from chess and wasn't really feeling enthusiastic about playing at that time, I actually decided to withdraw from it. And that spot went to uh, to Sean Press, who was a second place getter in the zonal. So it shows the reward of playing the zonals that even if you don't win it, maybe you get second and still can end up in the tournament if the first place getter decides not to play or simply can't play. And he has Sarin, who just came off a win in two Serbian Open tournaments. He had a nice win in the Parison uh, tournament, I believe. He had a win against uh, Seguani. Uh, Khan beat uh, Lima. Uh, we also see here, going to section 11, that Kisada Perez beat, uh, had a draw, rather, with uh, Krisa uh, and two uh, players from Latin American countries. Uh, or actually, in Cuba, it's in Caribbean, but you get the idea. Um, so Adli had a win against fellow Egyptian Hesham. Uh, we can see also another walkover where, you know, because of the COVID situation, it, we see uh, the New Zealand player, our uh, fan, was unable to get to the tournament, and so uh, Lupulesu has a walkover. Taba Tabai beat uh, Al Kadami. Uh, Kadrich beat uh, Dan Basurin Batsurin. Uh, we also see Ante Brukic beating uh, Barrientos. So these games, like, they're basically a lot of them are going to rating, as you can see. Indric beating Draskovic. Matirosyan beating Wali. Uh, Yilmaz beating uh, Norman Omar, uh, Mikatarian beating uh, Gonzalez Zamora in a game that's quite close by rating. And section 13, so only four sections to go, guys. We see Maradi Abadi having a walkover win against similarly rated Helgi Damziska and playing against uh, MVL in the next game. Uh, so next up, we also have Paravyan winning against Tissa, Onishuk beating Sale Sale, Pragnanda beating Bersamina. And Krasenkau beating Sevenik, so no real surprises in Section 13. Yoda Chesu had a draw with the young uh, Russian talent Mersin, who I think he's not... I think he might be a Grandmaster Elect, if I remember correctly, because now he recently had some very good tournament results. Uh, Braun had a draw with Jutska, and the game is a little bit of an upset there, uh, with being a draw and this rating difference. Apparent beat uh, Lainage from Sri Lanka. Diak had a walkover win against Salvi. And we see another upset here. Not a huge upset, because only a rank difference of probably 40 points, but at a game, Vokidov won against Paichadza, so a very good result for the Uzbek talent. Uh, also, we see a draw between Albanoz Cabrera from Cuba against uh, Platt from the Czech Republic. Zero Book had a win against Yonadis. Uh, Svana beat El Gindi. And Anderson, we see it was a bit of an upset loss, lost to Salinas Herrera. Probably only about a 50-point rating difference, but still, like, at this point, we'll count every upset we see. And for the final section, I know one match I was definitely curious about was how the world's youngest GM of all time, Abhimanyu Mishra, who earned the title recently at 12 years, 4 months, and 25 days, actually in his last Tom 4 World Cup. Well, he lost to Bajor Jababa. Jababa has played a very good game in the middle game. Ivan Isovic had a walkover win against Andres Rodriguez Vila. Motilev beat Mohamed El Arabi. Jumabayev beat 80. And finally, we have Megaranto and Game Megami drawing their game in a battle between two uh, Asian countries here. So there you are. Those are all the different results. So that those of you who, let's say, have some favorite players or players you're rooting for, well, now you know how they did. And now that we've seen all of these results, it's a good time for us to actually look at some games and not just, you know, see the recap of the results, but also what were some of the highlights in terms of the not just the results, but some positions and some games that were. So let's get into that. The first game I want to share with you is a game between Ponkratov against uh, Sousa. You may recall that this was a game where Sousa, representing Portugal, raid 2390 IM, was actually winning against Pontrakov. I think this is quite a significant game because Pontrakov was just coming off 
winning the Russian Higher League event, where he won with, I think, 7 out of 9, if I remember correctly, qualified for the Russian uh, Championship, uh, as it were. This is also a tournament where Alexandra Goyashkina uh, actually broke 2600 for the first time, and she also qualified for the Russian uh, Championship, the first female player to do so, to qualify for the Russian uh, Open Championship, uh, as it were. So let's see how this game went. Obviously, my commentary is going to be a bit briefer than usual because there are a lot of games to go through, but you can see that this is an Italian game where all very standard. A3 is a little bit, I think, unnecessary compared to the usual Castle C3, but not a direct mistake. We had A6, C3, and we see Arponkratov going for an approach that actually I used to play quite a bit, let's say, in my late teen years. It's an approach where you delay the move of castle short, and you instead have some ideas of maybe being able to castle without needing to play rookie one to play the standard Lopez maneuver of knight f1 g3. The idea being that also with a knight g3 it might help support e4. But also when black has played g6, it means that later on you might have ideas like g4, g5, and going for a kingside attack if they castle short. So that's kind of White's idea behind this knight f1 and trying to sort of save some time. But it does have its disadvantages as well, and d5 was a very good move by uh, by Sousa. I think the normal move for white would just be to play queen e2, keep that tension so that you can take back on e4, and then with moves like knight c3, three and castles, white will get chances to attack the black king when black castles short, and both sides will have their chances. But instead we had e takes d5, and I think that while that's not objectively a mistake, I think that in principle allowing black to have that space in the center does put the onus on white to be somewhat precise at this point. After castles, black played a move queen d6, which I think is a very interesting move, keeping the option that maybe you'll want to castle long and attack this pawn at some moment. White played a move bishop a4, which I think was aimed against this idea, trying to put some pressure on that e5 pawn. Uh, of course, a move like rook e1 and knight e4 are also possible. Uh, so black plays b5 to break the pin, and so this is an idea that you see quite a bit from more advanced players where they're going to move their piece back and forth in order to provoke a weakening pawn move. White's argument being that the pawn b5 move is so weakening that it's worth giving black an extra tempo to prompt this move. Which I'm not sure it's entirely true, but definitely the idea is not so bad. Black played a move f5 to stop knight e4. Of course, castling would also be quite normal. And I think probably more precise, because now with d4, white was able to start to open up the center using the fact that black king is in the middle. Uh, black therefore tried to keep things closed with e4 here, which actually is probably a mistake in this position. Black probably should brave e d4 and, you know, say, okay, I'm not that afraid of the e file because I can castle next turn and keep my king safe at least. Uh, but after e4, knight h4, the problem for black is not just that this pawn is under attack, but there's also the threat of queen h5 forking the king and the pawn. That forces the move castles, and now bishop d5 is a very strong move, uh, because bishop takes d5 would leave the pawn on uh, f5 undefended. So black had a take with the queen to keep it safe. But then knight g6, and the problem here is that you actually aren't able to move your rook to safety. Uh, let's say, for example, black plays some move like rook f d8, for example. Unfortunately, this runs into some tactical problems, and... If you want, you can pause the video here to see if you can find this tactic, because it's quite a beautiful one and not that easy to see. I'll have a sip of water while you think about it and reach for the pause button if you want to try it. Okay, so if you're wondering why I put the rook on d8, it's so that if white were to go knight f4, queen d7, and then captures on e6. The problem is that if the rook was on some other square, you'd have d5 and you'd just win a piece with the fork. But with the rook f d8, you don't have that and black is basically going to be fine. So knight f4 is not the answer in this version. But the move bishop h6 is very strong. Uh, if black doesn't take, he's simply lost to pawn. But after queen h5, we start to see the problem that white is going to take this pawn. The knight's going to come in and it's going to be very hard to defend those uh, weak dark squares. And if you play a move like, let's say, king to h7, trying to defend the pawn, you're running into the move knight f4. And the problem with knight f4 is not just that the queen is under attack, but you're also threatening queen g6, forking the king and the bishop. So, for example, queen d7, just queen g6 is completely game over. And so we can see that black's best move is actually the move he played. And we have to give black credit for 
still finding the best move even after blundering, playing move queen d7. And while light is still better in this position after knight f8 and rook f8, he has an exchange up after all, we can see that black does have some compensation. He's managed to get a nice space advantage. If he could get in moves like f4 and f3, that white queen could suddenly be quite exposed. And that's one reason why instead of the move a4 that white played in the game, which I don't think was probably the best decision. Okay, to be fair, it's not such a bad move either, but I think that more practical would be to either play knight h5, not allowing black to get in that f4 move, or, and maybe also knight f4 can help to support fd5 and maybe block the uh, the dark squares as well for a bit. Uh, or a move like rook e1 would also be quite good, just so that if f4 you can take with the knight and it just sort of anticipates f4 and makes it really hard for black to get it in. If White had found either of these moves, I think that he would have a clear advantage. Instead, White played a4, which is still fine. I mean, at this point, it's not too late to still play some of the moves I mentioned, like rook e1, for example, would still be playable. The computer actually has a very unconventional idea of playing d5 and sacking the pawn, basically to try to open up the files for the rook. There's a bit of an advanced idea, but maybe not entirely silly at this point. Uh, but White played rook e1. It's a perfectly fine move, I think. Black played a move b3, trying to keep the position closed, which actually I think this might have been an important loss of time, because White's not really threatening to take that pawn, because then Black is just going to take on d4 with the knight, uh, or with a piece. So actually a move like knight a5, and going knight b3, and using that hole that was created with a4, that's probably the best try to punish White's play at this point. Uh, but b3 was played, and... You know, if White plays some move like Queen E2 and goes for the F3 break, I feel like that's probably going to be close to winning for White. But instead, White played Knight H5, which, okay, it's still fine. Uh, Bishop C4 was a good move, not allowing that Queen E2 for a second time. And yeah, at this point, this is one of these positions that I think is very dynamic. Obviously, Black has a very good grip over the light squares. And I think that if White doesn't do something quite direct here, his position could even become quite difficult. So in that case, I think White's best option might actually have been a move like h4, which looks completely counterintuitive to push pawns around your king, but it also means that when you play knight f4, they don't really have g5 anymore, because you can take and weaken the black king quite a lot with that exchange of pawns. So I think that this was probably the better way to play it, uh, not just knight f4, but also bishop f4 is now an idea, because again, the h-pawn is stopping uh, g5 break. And if black does play some move like, I don't know, queen d8 to attack the pawn, well, white can actually just ignore it with rook e3. Uh, and rook e3 would also have been a good move instead of h4 for what it's worth. But if queen h4, white just gets a very nice attack. You know, a move like rook to g3 would be perfectly fine just hitting this pawn and taking the initiative. The computer, being a genius, points out that you also have the move of knight takes g7 with the point that after king g7... And rook h3 that once the queen moves, you're going to take h6 and, well, just basically get back your material and still have a big attack on the king. But okay, that's a little bit of a computer line, so I don't completely blame white for not seeing h4, but I do think that rook e3 and rook g3 is definitely findable here and would be very, still very good for white. Um, but after a5 instead, yeah, black goes knight e7 and for a very decent move to reroute the knight. It means that rook e3 is, well, if you don't play rook e3 now, you're not really going to get it in another time. But rook e3 also feels a little bit out of place at this moment. Uh, white played a move f3. You know, probably should try to get his bishop out again. At least if bishop f4, g5, maybe you can put your bishop on e5 and have a good outpost for the bishop that way. But white played a move f3. And in principle, f3 is a good move, I think, trying to open up the rook. But unfortunately, it just doesn't work that well in this exact position. Because white has not developed his queen side whatsoever. And that gives black the time to go c5 and bring his bishop to life. And White's next moves weren't the best here. Uh, okay, fe4 is maybe not so terrible, but after this and bishop e3 and knight f5, the game started to sort of slip through White's fingers at some point. Uh, queen g4 is a very good move, making sure that you're not threatening to take on e3 just yet. Uh, now, the normal move for Black would just be to play cd4, you know, just take back the, the pawn, and that way you have a, you know, a pawn for the exchange, and when you've got the... Uh, well, if I play out these exchanges just to so kind of see how the position plays out. Well, we can see here that black can either take b2 and have a strong pass b pawn. Or I can go bishop d3 and have a strong pass e pawn. We see the rook's not really doing very much. And this position probably ultimately is close to equal, according to the computer. But it does require some slightly tricky moves to find. Okay, to be fair, I guess queen b2 is not that tricky, uh, in all fairness. 
But okay, the game saw Queen F7 instead. And here is actually where White missed a Gilt Edge chance to win the game. So again, if you want to, you can try to find the move for White. I know I'm spending a lot of time on this game, but this is actually, a, I think, one of the most interesting games of the round. Uh, it's a good example of why you shouldn't judge a game just because it was a draw or just by the result. So are you able to find the opportunity that the players missed here? Okay, uh, well done if you came up with the move Rook F1. Uh, which, okay, at first it looks like suicide chess, because you're allowing bishop takes, but the point is that after rook f1, you're now threatening to play rook takes f5, and if queen takes f5, you're going to have the move queen takes g7 checkmate, and black doesn't really have a good way out of it, because a move like g6, just go knight g3 and just hit the knight, if they play knight takes e3, which was my first thought as maybe the best try for black, well, it turns out after the trade of queens that you've got this intermediate move of rook takes g7, backed up by the knight. And then after king h8 and rook a7, it just turns out that black has nothing here. Thought white is up a full pawn. The e pawn isn't going anywhere because we just put our rook behind the pass pawn of rook e7. And if knight f2, we can simply just take the pawns and basically that pass a pawn is going to be a winner for white. Not to mention, of course, that white is currently up two pawns here. So rook f1, yeah, would actually basically just win the game, in fact, for white. Unfortunately, white blundered into a big tactic, and yeah, I realize the position is very complicated, it's not as easy as the engine makes it out to be, but definitely it's a position where whoever has the initiative is going to just completely control the play. And the move king h1 actually is a sort of move where you almost would wish you would rather pass in such a position, because now black found a tactic queen takes h5, just winning a piece completely for free. That is what I mean, it's a sort of position where obviously... You don't resign as white because, you know, it's a two-game match and a loss with white is almost like signing your own death warrant to uh, do this. But after d takes c5, black played knight to g3. Not the most precise, but still good enough here. After rook a4, bishop d3, and now rook to b4. Here I have a feeling that black might have got intimidated a little bit by the rating of his opponent. Maybe start having some thoughts like, oh, what if I blow this or, you know, a draw against a... Uh, 2600 plus GM is a, a good result. And I think that's the reason why I probably went for 92 and decided just to repeat moves with knight g3 and basically just force a draw in this way. And you know the draw was agreed as uh, as White claimed it with King h1 as it were. But what Black should have done instead, you know, he had a chance to beat a 2600 plus GM. I don't know if this would have been his first win over a 2600 plus GM, but I mean, if you got the chance, you take it. Uh, the move knight f5 would just be completely winning here. In fact. Um, there might be some other winning moves as well. I mean, rook c8 and picking off that pawn should also definitely be good enough here. Uh, so yeah, I'm not quite sure why black didn't do this. I'm guessing he was just afraid of his opponent, maybe. If white does play some move like bishop d4, you know, trying to save this past c pawn, which is basically white's one hope to not lose here. I mean, black has various winning moves, but I think that bishop b8 is probably the most clinical. I mean, pushing the e pawn would probably have been fine as well, to be honest, but... That is just going to go bishop g3, force that rook away from the e-file, and then we're going to be able to take and play like e3, e2, and basically this e-pawn is just going to be absolutely unstoppable once we get that rook out of the way of e1. Uh, my arrow's a little bit off, but you get the idea. So yeah, this was a really interesting game and definitely I think one of the highlights of this, uh, of this round. And having saved this game, let's now see another one from one of the upsets that I mentioned before. So the next game I'd like to share with you is the win by English IM Ravi Haria against Vadim Stragantsev with Haria raid 2440, Stragantsev 2608. And this was a very nice technical endgame by White, where White just simply outplayed his opponent. And Black's choice in the opening actually is a little bit surprising to me. I mean, the classical French obviously is nothing terribly wrong with this opening, but it kind of surprises me that Black went for a line that basically is well known to be solely playing for a draw. I mean, I guess Dragonsev's logic is that he wanted to try to press with White in the next game and hold a solid draw. But I would have thought that against a lower eight play, he might try to keep more play in a position and move like a6 or bishop e7, for example. So he went cd4, knight d4, bishop c5, queen d2. And yeah, the move a6 was played. You know, Black is sort of delaying castling. So I guess he wants to not give White some easy plan like going for a kingside pawn storm. So he's trying to be tricky with the move order. Now, the move castles long would be quite normal at this point. At least this would be the main move here. Uh, but white plays queen f2 instead, which actually might not be such a bad move either, because it does 
create some possibilities to potentially discover an attack on the bishop. And the way in which black dealt with that was playing knight takes d4. Bishop takes d4. Uh, and now the move after takes, he decides to capture and then play queen b6. It's an approach that's not really very trendy anymore because it's a line where black is sort of known to be basically suffering in this endgame due to his bad light squared bishop. At the same time, it is very solid for black. He did manage to get in the extra move of a6 compared to the normal lines. Though I don't think it makes that big of a difference in this particular case. You know, white should still be slightly better. But in the game, white kind of made it look easy because of black's mistakes. We had bishop d3, bishop d7. You know, 92, very standard idea to put the knight on the d4 outpost. Uh, black decided to play f6. And I think that, yeah, f6 maybe not such a bad move, actually. There are other approaches well where you could sit and wait for longer with moves like king e7, rook c8. But they're not really moves that are going to pressure white in any sort of way. F6, at least you're trading some pawns, which in principle is meant to help you a little bit when you are worse to trade off the pawns and improve your drawing chances that way. Black played F takes E5 immediately and after F E5, King E7. Well, White played a move King to D2. You know, the computer wants to go castles instead, but honestly, the difference is not that great. Uh, and now Black played Bishop E8. So, so far, looking at this point, you would think that, okay, Black is just going to play some move like Knight D7. Pressure to pawn, maybe go bishop g6 to trade as bad bishop. And it's just going to be a very straightforward draw with white having no real way to pressure. But it turned out quite differently in the game. Black played bishop g6. White kept the tension with rook f3. Um, it's an important point that you don't want to take here. Because you're actually going to lose a pawn. Not only is this pawn under threat, but this knight c4 is also a fork. Okay, I guess technically knight f3 probably still saves a pawn. But it's still a big concession on white's part. So it's better just to let them take you. Instead, like white did with rook f3, and, well, we see this battle for the uh, the open file, and, well, when you have rooks facing the open file like this, it means that trades are going to be more or less inevitable at some stage. Though I think that there was no real reason for black to trade on f3. I think that was a little bit of a strategic mistake, and a little bit of a surprising one to me, actually, because I know that the Soviet players, a lot of them are very well known for being very good at understanding when you should exchange pieces and when you shouldn't. So in that sense, a little bit surprised that Stragonsev didn't just keep the tension with knight d7. Because I mean, you're happy if they take with rook takes f8. Because I mean, you can always just take back and, you know, white just, you know, doesn't have anything down the file. And you're happy if they take on g6, because that helps your h8 rook get into the game. So basically the ending would just be a draw in this case, uh, at a higher level of play. But instead we had rook takes f3. And the reason that this is a mistake is because of g takes and all of a sudden, the structure just really transformed in White's favor. Because that pawn that was previously isolated and a weakness on e5 is now defended by another pawn. After bishop takes d3, cd3, White still has the better knight. So all of a sudden, White has managed to get some legitimate winning chances here. And they end up even increasing after some further mistakes by Black. You know, rook f8, probably not the best move here. Because White could have played a move like bishop e2 and kind of pressure the e6 pawn in. Even though the bishop is outside the pawn chain, which is still some sort of achievement, a lot of these pawns are kind of fixed on the light squares. So they can be potential weaknesses for the white bishop to attack down the road. Uh, well, rook f3 was played. I uh, don't really agree with bishop takes d3. Probably bishop e4 is a more dynamic approach to the position. Where in that way, you know, if white takes... Yeah, the pawns are doubled, but on the other hand, you also have tricks like rook f1 or rook f2. It's going to run into something like knight takes e5 just using the pin on, on this. So it turns out this ugly looking idea of doubling your pawns works because you basically win the f4 pawn with tactics, which is quite nice. Um, so the move bishop d3 was played, and after cd3, white's just clearly better. And that's an advantage that only increases after black not perhaps defending in the best way. I mean, g6 and rook c8 is fine. You know, he's making sure to not give an easy invasion down the c file. Rook a3, also a good move to try to provoke some weakening pawn moves. So black defends with the knight, but now the knight is passive and with king d2, white is making sure that black rook does not have any entry points down the c file. Therefore, the rook is really not that useful for black. And well, black's best option is basically to sit and wait, but it's also very psychologically unpleasant to do so. You know, probably a move like king f7 and maybe even some idea like being h of h5 and just trying to not give white an easy way to open the position and create further weaknesses. That might be the best chance to hold. Instead, of the game saw king e8, we had rook g1, and I feel like this position is already going to be technically winning for white, in fact. I think it's kind of important that black maybe could have considered trying to get counterplay, but it's hard to give him good advice, honestly. Uh, black decided to go for a waiting strategy, rook c8, 
White played a4, and after knight d7, I really like white's next move here. So what do you think is the right pawn break for white to try to create some sort of weaknesses in black's structure? I'm pausing here so that you have a chance to, uh, to find the move for yourself. Okay, well done if you came up with the move h4. Now, to be fair, moves like a5 to kill the knight or king e3, I mean, they're also going to be winning, so... You know, obviously more than one way to play it, but I think that the real key to converting the advantage will be to get in the move h5. Also as well, time, because black wasn't able to block with h5, because then his pawn would have been on pre. So this all worked very well, where, you know, if black doesn't take, white can play moves like h6 and get the fawn pawn in. You know, it's so instructive, I actually want to show it on the board, what might happen there. Because then you can put your knight on g5. And what you see is that because of that fawn pawn, black can't really let that pawn get taken, or white just has a very strong pass pawn. But if you play something like knight f8, we kind of see that this kind of position is just an absolute nightmare for black. The knight here is completely paralyzed, the, and white is just basically able to kind of make some inroads, you know, play some move like a5, force some concessions that way, and then you'll be able to get in with the king after a trade of rooks. And I'm pretty sure that plan is going to be winning unless I have miss something very obvious but it feels like eventually white's just going to find a way through with some maneuvers uh of course it's worth pointing out white could also play hg6 and also just say that this pawn is a weakness and you know maybe that's even a better way to play it to keep the position more open as it were uh, but dragon said he didn't like the look of this so he played gh5 and you know from here you know rook g5 and i think that the position is probably technically winning at this point and i don't think that white messed it up but i guess it's worth Having a quick look just so we can admire uh, White's technique. So you see he's doing a good job of cutting the Black King off here. Uh, make sure that I said H point isn't going to get active. Uh, now apparently F5 was a faster win. So that if Black were to take you would have Knight F5. And you'd have all kinds of nasty forks would be the, the tactical idea behind F5. Uh, but the move A5 doesn't spoil anything either. After Knight G6 White played a very nice move here. Uh, showed a really great technical skill with B5. Realizing that black's not really threatening to take that pawn because then rook f1 is going to win the knight uh, Black played the move a takes b5. You're probably realizing if white gets something like b a6 and the rook on b6 That he's not really going to be able to keep a6 and e6 both defended long term So a b5 was played but still the b7 pawn is now a weakness because we got knight d6 and rook b1 to gang up on it as it were king g7 knight d6 I'll just quickly show you the final moves of the game just so you can see how white won. So h5, king e3. You're all very solid. White just making sure everything is protected. Knight c5, a nice move to hit the weakness on e6. And while well, the exchange of pawns would give white connected pass pawns that would be clearly winning. Uh, we had knight e7. White defend his pawn with rook a1. Knight f5, king f2. And, and I mean, once your rook is behind the pass pawn like this, black is basically only playing on for spite. If you want to take e6, there's nothing wrong with that either. But, okay, why decide to do it here? Uh, king h5, king f3, h3, and yeah, rook g1, a, a nice little move to have some rook to uh, g5 ideas. After rook a6, actually, white found another way to win, where he played the move king knight to g7. But what white was worried about was that if rook g5, that this could get a little bit tricky of, like, if rook f5, for example, would actually already be, uh, would already be only drawing because of h2 and... Actually, it's almost kind of a study-like trap here. We see king g2, because obviously the white rook can't get back to stop the pawn in time. And it turns out this would actually only be a draw after king g3, that, you know, with the threat of rook a2, mate, white would basically be forced to kind of move back and forth. And so that's the trap that uh, Zagintsev set, which is actually quite clever, because it forced white to find the only winning move in this position, which is a move knight g7. And after that, white gets the rook behind the pass pawn, or, you know, if black does try to block, then the king will come gobble on h3 and win the pawn ending the game ended rook a3 rook h7 king g6 rook h3 rook d3 and dragon 7 was designed about even waiting for white's next move because after king g4 it's quite obvious that the past pawns are just way faster than this guy if black were to try a block with rook d4 trying to stop f5 with a pin you know white just goes rook b3 and you know once you get that king up and get that e pawn moving it's just going to be completely game over where this deep one is way, way too slow. So a very instructive game for sure. And I think you guys definitely admired Haria's excellent uh, end game technique in this game. Like if you didn't know who the players were, you'd probably think that White was the one who was 150 points higher rated. So a very impressive game. 
And uh, let's see uh, another one as well. I want to look at another one of the upset games because those are the ones I think that will... Well, it's only the most uh, fun. Like, oh, wow, like he beat this high rate player. Despite what I just said, I'm actually going to show you that game I mentioned between Richer against Jababa. Because I think that it's sort of a kind of very topical point. Like, who doesn't want to see how the youngest grandmaster of all time is playing their game? So this game will kind of show that. And this is a game where Mishra was white, Jababa was black. And I'm showing it from Jababa's perspective. Actually, Mishra ended up getting a small edge out of the opening, I think. I think Jababa, well, he often likes to go his own way. And so he decides to play this very safe line of the uh, of the Bogo Indian with Bishop takes D2. And then just D5, like basically playing a Queen's Gambit accepted, but where the dark square bishops were traded. Which is a small achievement for white. It does mean that you can play E3 and you don't have to worry about shutting in your bishop anymore. But of course, black is quite solid with no real weaknesses. So I guess both players were probably happy with the outcome of the opening. We had rook C1. So it's kind of like a flexible waiting move, just sort of waiting to see what black is going to play. And saying that if black plays DC4, that white can play bishop take C4 in one go without having moved the bishop first. Uh, to be fair, probably even here, something like rook D8 and C5. Probably still gives black very decent chance of equality, just because he has absolutely no weaknesses whatsoever. Um, so for that reason, why could have considered taking a bit of move earlier. This is what the engine recommends as a way to get a small pull. But he decides to do it after rook d8, which might actually be a slightly better version, maybe. Because uh, the rook is not doing that much on d8 at the moment. Uh, white played bishop d3, so all very standard. And the one way for black, I guess, to try to get some value out of the move order could be to try to play knight e4. But right now, it seems a bit too early, because I think white's just going to play queen c2 and... Well, it won't be so easy to maintain that knight when you've got so many pieces to attack it. Uh, so black plays knight c6. Again, very creative approach by Jababa. I think if white had played some normal move, like either h3 to just not give the bishop a good square and kind of leave this knight looking a little bit stuck. Or even a move like castles just develop normally and, you know, if bishop g4 just move the knight or, or I play queen d1 or something. I feel like that sort of position would be very slightly better for white. The knight's maybe not that great on c6, but it's not absolutely terrible either, contrary to the old school theory. Uh, but instead, Mishra played in a very forcing way with bishop b5, which actually is maybe not such a bad move at this point, because bishop d7 is admittedly not the most active square for the bishop, and I think that, again, a move like just normal a tree or castles would keep a small pull. But Mishra made the mistake of playing a little bit too forcingly, and okay, it's true, he's 12 years old, so it's natural that Nearly all these players are going to have a very direct style of play. But in this particular position, like this sort of trying to attack at all costs was not really the, the right approach. Because after bishop c6, you're kind of solving the problem of black's misplaced knight on c6, which was stopping black from building a nice pawn chain. Not only that, but after the move knight e5, which was played in the game, what we kind of see here is that after castles and c5, that suddenly black has managed to get a pawn break in and white doesn't have the option of d5 to say, put a knight on d4 and have a good knight against a bad bishop in an IQP position, that is, I say, queen's pawn position, because the knight on e5 is hanging. So we see that it's already gone just slightly wrong for white. The engine will tell you it's equal, but I think already it's practically easy to play black because the momentum is sort of moving now in his favor. Maybe the best try for white is actually to play a move like f3 and just try to maybe bring this knight perhaps toward the king's side and try to maneuver in that fashion. Because at least then if black plays cd4, you can try to make the argument then that your knight will be better than the bishop in a symmetrical structure. Uh, but instead, queen e2 was played, and it sort of feels like around here that white was maybe a little bit lacking for a plan. The game went rook a c8. Actually, I like the idea of trying to get in b5 more quickly. That's what I would have gone for. Because once you kick the knight from c3, that does sort of lose, make it much harder for white to get in the move e4 as a break in reply to c4. But anyway, the game went rook fd1, h6. I don't entirely 100% agree with the moves, but they're not really mistakes either. Uh, black played b6 again, keeping the tension. Like I said, I think that a move like c4 is definitely very interesting. I guess the reason you might be worried about c uh, not playing c4 is maybe you're worried about e4. But I think that black can just ignore it with c b5. Because normally white would go e5 and just have a very nice pawn storm and a nice advantage. But here we see that 95 actually gets in the way for white. Meanwhile, black's ready to play moves like b4, and it just seems to me that, or maybe d4 and then b4. And it just seems to me here that like white just doesn't have the right harmony to get the, the pieces organized. So that's what I would have done, but the game went b6. 
White played king to h1. The engine wants to go queen a6, trying to fix this pawn as a target, which is sort of hard to argue against. Uh, and again, black didn't play c4, so we can kind of see here that, you know, I guess can give some encouragement that even 2500, 2600 GMs can make some positional misjudgments uh, from time to time. And, well, this uh, middle game, I guess, is an example of that, with black trying too hard to keep the tension. Uh, white played g4, and, yeah, this is where the game starts to kind of unravel for white. I mean, the idea of playing g4 and trying to pawn storm, I think it's an idea that does have some logic when you have, uh, when the center is completely stable. But for a moment, black still has possibilities to open up the center or even just to kick the knight away like we saw in the game with knight to h7, which probably is not as good as c4 first, but it's not terrible either. And at this point, well, even though the computer is still saying that the position is only slightly better for black, in the long term, white's king is quite exposed. So if white ever were to lose the initiative, it could really come back to haunt him. It also means ideas like, say, dc5 and e4 are not really going to be candidates anymore with this uh, open king side. So I play queen f2, and again, black doesn't play c4, which is a little surprising to me, because I think if you don't play c4, I'm not really quite sure how else you make progress. I mean, you can maybe try to attack e3, but it's pretty easy for white to defend it, uh, in all fairness. And the black knight is admittedly a long way from the e4 outpost. Well, Jababo goes queen e8. Uh, white plays knight h4, which I think is a very decent plan in general. Maybe it would have been more effective when the queen was still on e7, but it's not that disastrous. Uh, black played b5, which actually is quite a good move. Kind of showing actually why knight h4 is a little bit imprecise, probably on the last move. Because now you're not able to take that pawn, because then d4 comes with a check. And that kind of shows why g4 was not so great earlier, in fact. Because now black gets his much faster play on the uh, on the queen side, where he, after all, has the, the pawn majority. The game went knight e2, c4. White tried to tie up the board with b4, which in retrospect is probably the decisive mistake of the game. I think your best chance here is why is you're very committed to the king side attack. I think at least with knight g3 you can be consistent, and I mean, it's not like you've got any particular threats, but you never know when you might get some counterplay and can at least try to create some swindling chances. Whereas b4, yeah, just strikes me as like trying to play on the side of the board where you're weaker, and also makes this pawn a target to a5, which was played in the game. You know, ba5 might look like a safe pawn grab, but in reality, after a move like rook a8, black will get the pawn back very soon. And then the a2 pawn is going to be, uh, well, a rather serious weakness being an isolated pawn at this point on the uh, half-open file. So we just gang up on it like that. Uh, the game saw a3 instead. We had takes, takes. And now queen e7 just hitting the weakness. And after rook b1, black played bishop d7. Kind of showing up that this pawn's a bit weak as well. Uh, white played a move knight c3. I guess he... Realize that letting black do moves like rook e8 or even something like rook a7 is just going to be very, very difficult for white to hold. So Schmishra to his credit goes into swindle mode and plays knight c3, trying to create some sort of counterplay. Black played bishop g4, correctly realizing that the attack on the g file is actually not as scary as it looks. Uh, if you're wondering why white didn't play knight b5, it's because obviously, yeah, this, uh, this rook is on. And white wouldn't be able to play knight c7 to keep material parity. Because then queen e4 check is going to, to win the king and the rook. So that's a, an important point to see when playing bishop g4. The game went rook g1, black played h5, which is not quite as good as f5, which would be a bit more solid. Uh, you know, if white plays move like queen g3 and maybe goes h3, he you know, actually has got some decent chances to save the game here, I think. Uh, just because h5 was kind of weakening. Instead, after rook g3, black played the move g5. Again, not the most precise, but not terrible either. We had takes, takes, knight g6. So White at least gets his knight to the e5 outpost. It's a small gain, but after bishop f5, black is still up of solid pawn, and the knight is just doing a very good job at blocking the counterplay. Probably the best try is to go rook f1 and at least gain a tempo on the bishop, uh, which also might buy you time to take b5 later, maybe, at some point. Because after rook bg1, uh, black played g4, and... Yeah, White played h3, he's trying to get some counterplay, but with rook g7, we see that the g pawn is just too well defended here. Uh, and after rook 3, g2, um, which is a nice move actually, by the way, going for queen h4 and trying to increase the pressure on the pawn, but it's just kind of too little too late here. And after rook f8, we kind of see that after queen h4, knight f6, that, well, White's not able to take on b5. You know, it might be a question a few of you guys had, like, can White take on b5? But the answer is no because of bishop e4 and that's just going to pick up the rook. 
Uh, the game ended Rock to F1, and you know, by this point, Black's clearly winning, so I'm going to go through the final moves pretty fast. So we had knight e2, g3. That's uh, just quite clever, actually, knight g3. The idea is that Black has bishop h3, and you kind of see that the pin is a bit annoying for white. So rook f8, king f8, rook g1. Uh, Black played a move, knight takes g3, just swapping everything down. And yeah, you're probably aware of the principle that inferior knight and queen, uh, uh, knight and queen are going to be better than a bishop and queen on average, but this decision is kind of an exception, or at least it would be if black played bishop f5, because then you just put the bishop on e4, and somehow the white king would just be way too exposed in that position. But so after bishop g4, actually Mishra sort of gets a chance to save himself here, which it turns out he didn't really take full advantage of as he lost the game. But what I could have done is he could have played this move of queen h4, and it just gives this very annoying idea where you're just going to play moves like queen d8, queen g5 and basically just keep checking the king and if they try to go to this hidey hole on h7 watch can just play moves like queen d8 and you can't really get your queen active without allowing a whole slew of checks so it seems like to me that this probably would still allow white to hold a draw and that black actually uh, had blown the win here uh, now to be fair the move mishra played queen f4 it's not uh the worst move on the board but i do think that it does miss this opportunity and after queen f5, I feel like black is kind of back on track again. After queen h6 and king g8, we see that white just is not able to get the queen and knight around to create any sort of threats. Whereas the white king is still completely exposed at this point. So again, went king g2, bishop e2, king to g3. Uh, black played bishop f1, which is kind of a nice move. Just saying, well, you don't really have a great move. Like now, you know, if you play king h2, obviously queen h3 is and queen g2 is going to be mate. Moving the knight is kind of bad because you're allowing queen g4 check and that also is going to be mate. So it only really leaves queen moves available for white and none of them really are any good. Because wherever this queen goes, um, I should point out by the way, queen f4 would also lose to, to queen h3. Where this would be a nice little checkmate that kind of illustrates white's problem. That basically, if we take this position, white's effectively in Zugzwang at this point. Which is kind of funny, we have so many pieces on the board, but it turns out to be true. So I play queen c6 and the problem with queen c6 and pretty much any of the other queen moves is that it allows the move queen g5. If it wasn't for queen g5, white would start taking pawns and would suddenly save himself. But now, yeah, white has to go king f3, otherwise queen g2 would end up being a checkmate. Then we have queen g2 and... Oh, actually, black didn't play the move queen g2. He played queen f5 instead. Uh, the reason you should play queen g2 is so that you can play queen to e4 here. I'm guessing that Jabava didn't play this because he was nervous that maybe white can use this queen king to somehow mate the black king or create mating threats. But it doesn't really work. I mean, if you play, let's say, king g6 and try to use the pawn as a shield from the checks, well, black can just play, let's say, bishop to d3, for example. I mean, king to h5, you've got bishop e2, I guess, and, well, you achieved your purpose of getting rid of that pawn. You've got moves like queen to g3, and just with the right checks, you're going to kind of force some decisive concession for white. I mean, if white were to play, let's say, king f5, you've got queen h3, and, you know, king f6, you're getting, running all kinds of annoying checks, like, at some point, you might just be able to do some kind of skewer and just take the queen on, uh, on c6 and win the ending with the pass c pawn. But if you play something like king f4, then you're running into queen h4, and now after king e3... Uh, that, well, if king f3, you've got bishop d3 and some checks this way that will allow you to win. Uh, but if you go king e3, there's going to be queen e4. And Okay, it's a bit of a long explanation, but finally the point becomes clear that with this series of checks, we eventually are able to take that pawn with a check. Very important, so you don't have queen e8 check and mate. And then since we take the knight with check, we're just up two pawns and they have no real perpetual because we'll always be able to guard with the queen or block with the queen at some point. And so it will just be a win. Uh, but after queen f5, yeah, we had king g3, and again, we see that, you know, with black missing the second chance for queen g5 to g2, which is actually the only winning continuation here. Instead, black played h4, and I think his idea was he was trying to get for the same idea that I showed before, but saying, well, the h pawn doesn't matter. But it turns out, actually, it does matter here, because after queen e3, there's an extra option that white has that wouldn't really have made sense if the pawn was still on h5. If you want to see if you can defend better than Mishra, who I guess was probably in big time trouble at this point, then you're welcome to pause the video and see if you can play the position better with white to play. 
So it turns out that the only move to save the game fight is actually the move of King H4. And I think if the pawn was on H5, there'd be some move like Queen F4 to, or Queen D4. And I mean, in that case, like, you wouldn't have the move of Knight G4, obviously, if the pawn was on H5. But here it turns out you do. And basically, you're just uh, defending the king against checks. You're threatening a perpetual check yourself. And yeah, if you play something like Queen H8, which is the only real queen check for black, white well, just brings the king back and, you know, black can check back and forth, but he's not really making any progress. I mean, if queen E1 is played, you've got king G5 and you can meet queen E7. And it's just that black's king is too exposed and the fact the knight is also kind of participating in the attack basically just means that this is just going to end up being a draw the engine giving a zero 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 with a ring around the rosy game with the the queen and the king at this point um so yeah that's how white could have saved the game instead he played king h6 and well he was trying to block in a similar way with queen h6 knight g6 and this would actually be a study like win for white if it wasn't for the move queen to g7 and there's just no good way to deal with the check because king f5, bishop d3 is forcing off the pieces and after king g5, king h7, again, the only winning move. It turns out there's just no good way out of this pin, which also means there's no good defense to bishop d3 winning the knight. The game ended queen d5, queen g6 check, king f4, queen h6, king g3, queen e3, king g4, bishop e2, and after king f5, queen f3, now that the queens are being forced off and this pawn will queen, Armishra resigned here. So yeah, that was this game and definitely one that, well, had quite a lot of richness to it. It's definitely very instructive to see how Jabada outplayed his opponent from that tense Carlsbad uh, pawn structure and middle game. And also how Mishra could have saved the game and a few opportunities due to Jabada not showing the best technique. But it turned out that White missed those chances and so Jabada wins this game with Black. Meaning that to stay in the match, Mishra has to win with Black in the next game, which is obviously quite a tall ask against a 2600 Grandmaster. So we'll see what happens in day two for that one. Um, so yeah, I guess there is one other game that I'm sort of tossing up whether to cover it or not, because it's a really nice game, but also this video has already been like one hour long, which is already a fairly long sort of video in that sense. Okay, what I'll do is I'll show you this game, but I might not show the full game. I'm just going to show just the sort of early part of it, because there were some nice tactics that sort of played out there. So the final game I'm sharing with you is P. Inian's win against Sebastian Bogner from the, of course, uh, the round one, or rather day one of the FIDE World Cup. A very nice win by Inian, and let's uh, see how it went. So it's D4, D5, C4, C6. I'm going to fast forward a little bit past the opening phase, because I think it was not particularly critical. I mean, for example, the move A6 is kind of thought to be slightly worse nowadays because of either C5 or the move E3. And sort of meeting b5 with b3 kind of allows you to keep a small pull. Uh, but why played a4 instead? And that is a slight concession in the sense that, well, the insertion of a6 and a4, you would think that, okay, this square is weakened. On the other hand, it's not so simple. Because it turns out that the move dc4 is not as effective when these moves have been thrown in. You know, dc4, e4 now is not really so great for black. Because if you play b5, you're kind of giving white... You know, some options maybe to take and potentially to use that pin on the A file to uh, just win material. Uh, maybe not at this point right now, but certainly at a later stage. So it does mean that Black, well, he plays it in a classical QGD. And if the pawns were still on A2 and A7, then White would be slightly better. But the weakness of B4 kind of gives Black a semi-solid game here. So we had H6, Bishop H4. This is all pretty standard so far. You know, Bishop E2, Bishop D3. Honestly, not that big a difference because black played to move dc4 anyway. We had take c5, castles was played, and so we end up with this isolated queen's pawn position after white's move ed4, which is definitely the more dynamic approach to the position. You know, by contrast, move like knight d4 is safe, but black's just going to play bishop d7, knight c6, and with black having no weaknesses, it's just a very dry sort of equality. Uh, so... The move ED4, it spices the game up more by creating an isolated queen's pawn position. Where, I mean, I think as far as these versions go, it's about as good a version as you can really ask for for black. Because black's got a hold on B4 for the knight. The bishop's cleared to D4, so that means that potentially you might be able to trade off the minor pieces in order to neutralize white's early initiative that the extra space for the pawn gives him. White played rookie one, and your bishop D7 was black's choice. Which is perfectly fine. I mean, sometimes you also see the move b6 and going for the fiend carry that way. 
that just makes sure you defend d5 and don't give white a really good d5 break is kind of the idea there. Bishop d7 was played and there are a lot of moves here for white. I'd say they're more or less of equivalent value. The move queen d2 is white's choice, just connecting the rooks, preparing rook d1 and thinking about d5. And that's how the game played out. Rook c8, rook a d1. Uh, knight b4 was played, which I think is actually a little bit imprecise because I think that you want to keep that knight on c6 a bit longer just to kind of take some of the sting out of knight e5. For that reason, I think that a move like knight d5 would have been a reasonable option. The idea is that if they were to take, you have knight c takes e7 and, well, you basically defend your d5 knight with the recapture. You know, something like, for example, bishop d5. In some of these positions, like in the pre-computer era, it was thought that the knight was better than the bishop in these structures. But the tempo on a4 kind of changes things a little bit. Because it also kind of buys you time to go bishop g4 and trade off that annoying knight just to basically have equality. Uh, if you're wondering why it's thought that the knight's better than the bishop, it's because the white knight can attack the pawn on d5, which is fixed on a light square, which also can constrict some ability to d7 bishop. Of course, with the pawn on d4 being on a dark square, it means the bishop can never really get at it. Uh, also, move like knight h5, like I said before. You know, and just getting rid of the bishop should also be totally fine. It does kind of help as well that you are hitting that uh, that bishop on c4, so it does take a little bit of the sting out of white's initiative that way. Uh, probably position is about equal in that case. Uh, but black plays knight b4, and yeah, we see that black's handling the position is not ideal here. I mean, to be fair, maybe the move bishop b8 would still be quite okay for black. It looks like a very weird decision to kind of trap in your own rook, but it also kind of stops any of these ideas of maybe sacking on f7 and using this bishop. And it turns out the bishop's actually just a very good defender of the king side, so it's definitely one of these unorthodox looking, but actually very useful ideas to keep in mind that dates back to the time of Steinitz from his World Championship match against Zuckertort, where he used this idea to win a very important game. Instead, though, Bogner played the more ambitious Bishop C6, and that's a move that would actually be quite strategically justified to keep the grip over D5 if it wasn't for a nice tactical opportunity that Inian, Inian immediately exploited here. So what would be your move here? What would you play as white in this case? Can you find the, the key move? Okay, congrats if you found the move of knight to g6. Now, in fairness, knight f7 might also be good for white, just going for the material, but knight g6 is actually a lot more effective. I mean, black can't really ignore that knight on g6 because if you do play something like rook e8, you're running into knight takes e7. You don't have rook takes e7 because then bishop f6 and then queen h6 is going to win a pawn. So queen e7 is kind of forced there, but then the move d5 shows why it's often a real pain uh, for the opponent when their queen is opposite our rook, and why it's not very good to play these moves like rook e1 when the queen is on the e file, or rook d1 when the queen's on the d file. Because it turns out that even though the d5 pawn is covered no less than four times in theory, that actually it's a perfectly safe move to play. Because obviously you can't play e takes d5 because the queen will be hanging. You can't play knight f takes d5 because the queen will still be hanging to the bishop on h4. But if you take, then you kind of see that play out with bishop takes d5. And if bishop takes, then black just is not able to take back either way because of the double pin on the pawn and on the knight. So a very instructive tactical line there. So that more or less compels black to take the knight because otherwise the option is losing the exchange. And after bishop e6, the idea is that if black were to move the king away, which is kind of if he would like to play in theory, but... After bishop takes, the problem is that when you take back the bishop, now this bishop is undefended and white is just up in exchange for nothing. You know, queen g4, bishop g3 is, is just leading nowhere for black. So Bogner played rook f7, so that if bishop takes, at least he's keeping the bishop on e7 defended with the rook on f7. But it turns out that the move d5 is just pretty strong here. Uh, actually, there's also other moves like even bishop f6 is another idea, but rook d5 is kind of natural. The game went bishop d7, uh, I skipped ahead a little bit there. And then the game continued with white playing bishop takes. And okay, to be fair, maybe this line is not as winning as I had previously thought. I blame my, uh, I guess, the, uh, the injury analysis for kind of leading me astray there. Uh, but anyway, after this, you know, I think that uh, bishop takes, king takes. Uh, white played d6, which I think is a very sensible idea to keep the bishop stuck. It's a position where actually even the computer is kind of changing its mind as to who is better at this sort of point. But it does seem like after bishop f6 that white's got the momentum. You know, queen f6 is not possible because of knight e4. 
which is going to hit both the queen and the knight at the same time. So white's forced, black's forced to go gf6 and just weaken the king just a little bit. The move knight d5 was showing a very good energy, just continuing to hit the knight. Uh, and kind of forced black's next move, because knight e7 would kind of put a bone in black's throat right there. So knight d5 was played, takes king g7, queen b7, and yeah, even here after this move, rook c6, which is a very good move by Bogner. You know, black is still very much in the game here, because... If he's able to take that pawn safely or get the queens off, you know, suddenly those two bishops are definitely not to be, uh, not to be messed with. And, like, if you exclude all the other factors, you know, two bishops, I think, are as strong as a rook and two pawns on average. Uh, especially in, like, positions that you have where there are still quite a few pieces left on the board. You know, one principle that the rook tends to get a little bit stronger as the game goes on toward the later end game. So the fact it's still a middle game is kind of nice for the bishops in theory. Of course, there are some other specifics to the position that do make the position nice for white. But probably objectively, black can still hold. You know, after h4, you know, making some luff for the king, but maybe trying to weaken the king with h5 later as well uh, of black. Well, black played queen c8. And I mean, objectively, probably rook c8, queen c8 would be kind of the normal move. But it's also one way I think that black can probably hold without too much trouble. So white decided to be a bit practically annoying and play queen a7. Kind of saying, well, okay... It's a position where you can't really take my pawn yet because if you play rook takes d6, uh, let me play rook takes d6 as an example. Well, I can take and then play the move rook d1. And even though you're not technically threatening to play rook d6 yet because there's queen c1 and you've got some tricks like queen f4, you've kind of got this hanging in the air. And it means that after, let's say, queen c6 for argument's sake, white just goes queen d4 and it's just going to win one of these bishops because of the pin. So black's not really in a position where he can take with the rook. And if you take with the bishop instead, you kind of have a similar problem. But this is actually kind of a nice one where the move for white is not that easy to see. So well done if you manage to find it. The move is rook to e7. And while black has to take the rook, because always rook takes d7, but then rook d7 anyway. And it turns out you just win this bishop on the next move. And that's more or less going to be winning for white with the extra pawn and the much safer king to boot. I mean, throwing in a check doesn't really change anything, as you can see. So that kind of explains why Bogner played King G8, which to his credit is a very good move in this position. I know I said I was only going to show half of this game, but this game's been so interesting, I want to show it to the end. White played the move Queen to E3, which, I mean, it's as good as B4 or any other natural-looking move. And now Black played Queen B7, which actually, it might not seem like there's any difference between Queen B7 and Queen B8, but actually there is quite a big difference and a very subtle one. It turns out that the move queen to b8 was actually the right move here. And then if you play queen to e4, black can go king g7. And it turns out that h5 just doesn't really lead anywhere. And it, it basically, the black king is going to be perfectly safe. And you'll be able to take this pawn and more or less just be fine uh, as such. But the difference now is that after queen b7, and now to move queen e4, which was played in the game. Uh, probably h5 is also quite strong. But okay, after king g7, white decided to played a move of h5 at this moment. And yeah, it's one of these situations that's kind of interesting. At first, the computer thinks that white is winning. But if you go to much higher depth, it actually turns out that the move bishop f5, which black did find, actually keeps him in the game. So I have to give the players credit that they've actually played a very high-quality game after black's little slip in the early middle game. He's recovered very well. And at this point, black's probably actually still doing okay. That might be because white didn't play the move h5 first. I think this might be a much more effective move order because it means that now after gh5 and queen e4, they don't have this like bishop f5 to stop queen g6. And also it's kind of important to explain why the queen would be better on b8. Because if the queen was on b8, you just take this pawn and you would just basically be better. But obviously you can't play rook d6 because of queen takes b7. I know there are a lot of arrows, so just to show the moves, if bishop d6, well, white would have rook takes d6. And again, you can't take the rook because then the queen would be on pre. So it's a very subtle point as to why the queen is misplaced on b7, and you know, I kind of don't blame the players for not appreciating that at the time. So queen e4, king g7, h5. This is how the game went. And you know, black has actually managed to consolidate with queen d7. And at this point, you would think that maybe the most natural outcome would maybe be a draw around this stage. Although admittedly to move hg6 is a little bit careless, because you are giving back options like bishop g4 and trying to pick up the exchange, which really is not in the best interest of white. But instead, black played bishop d6. And now after rook d4, well, at least this pin is kind of giving white some hope. Even though materially after bishop g6, the uh, 
material is in Black's favor. We kind of see the bishops need some time to coordinate. You know, the Black King is exposed. The bishop is pinned. And so I could have played a move like b4 to try to exploit that and you know, maybe try to kick the rook away so that this pin gains a bit in strength. But I played rook ed1 instead. And it actually had paid off because black, after defending extremely well for a lot of moves here, finally black cracked and didn't find the one key move to stay in the game. Can you do better here? It's uh, black to play for this puzzle. So... Uh, well done if you came up with the improvement queen to e6. The idea of queen e6 is that we're not just breaking the pin, but also queen takes e6 would lose the queen to the bishop h2 discovered attack. So it turns out this does allow black to kind of harmonize his forces. And it means that on the next move he can play bishop e5, for example, and just basically keep everything well protected. I mean, after rook d7, bishop a7, white's probably still doing okay. You move like g5, b5. Queen h5 or g3, like, there are a lot of reasonable moves for white, but it would more or less keep the balance where white's past pawn and safer king would kind of make up for black's material advantage here. Unfortunately for black, he instead played a move queen c7, and that ran into the move b4. I mean, it's not like queen c7 is like losing instantly, but the problem is that you still can't move this bishop because of the rook d7, and with a move b5, it's going to put black into a tailspin. Uh, black played a move h5, and you know, white decided not to play the move b5 and force out black rook to the passive b6 square. He played a move rook queen e3 immediately, uh, which actually might be even a, a trickier move, because it kind of, yeah, sort of, well, gives black more chance, I guess, to m go wrong here. Uh, black played a move rook to c3. The computer recommends going h4, which already if h4 is the best move in this position, it's kind of a sign that things have gone wrong for black. Because then you are putting a pawn on pre and... So I'm admitting that you don't have a useful move here as black. But after rook c3, yeah, now queen e6 was incredibly strong. And the problem is if the bishop moves anywhere other than h2, you've got rook d7 winning the queen. So black went king eight, bishop h2. And after king h1, you know, making sure that bishop stays under attack to limit the possible squares for black's queen. Well, now black pinned his hopes on the move queen to e5. Uh, the computer thinks that king h6 is more resilient. But honestly, after rook d8, it's still going to be winning for white. You've got threats like rook h8 and you know, then the king won't be able to go back because of queen g8 made. And if the king goes to g5, then you're out in the open with the attack. So it's just kind of bad for black all around here. But after queen e5, white finished things off with rook d7. And again, we kind of see the black king is just too exposed and black has not really managed to coordinate his bishops and queen and rook here. And in fact, in the game, black sort of blundered and made in one. Although frankly, he was lost anyway, because I mean, moves like... Well, the threat is, let's say, black goes rook c2, for example. Then white's just going to go queen g7 and then win the queen with rook 7 d5. And there's not much a black can really do about that. But after bishop e4, okay, it's a sort of rage quit move. White played a move queen g7 checkmate and that was the end of the game. Not every day do you see a grandmaster game end in checkmate. So I guess I flourish to end it. So yeah, this was a rather long recap, but that's because I wanted to a explain what the World Cup is all about so you kind of understand how the tournament works and can follow the event without like asking you know why did this happen in the event or like what's going on here and two I also covered all the results so that you can follow how your favorite players are doing you know, maybe you have some players who are from your country and you know you're cheering them on you know like I'm with the Australian players uh, and also free we saw some very instructive and very entertaining games and I think that by going through these games each day it obviously helps you to be a better chess player and also to at the same time enjoy your chess even more by just appreciating the beauty of it more and more with each grandmaster game you see so yeah that's about all for me for my recap of day one uh, of course one thing to keep in mind is that as the rounds come on like obviously since the field is like or is basically halving from uh, the completion of round two onward there will be kind of less and less games each round to allow me to kind of well, rather than having like this smorgasbord, like which one do I pick? There are so many good games. It'll allow me to sort of narrow it down a little bit more. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, if you guys are, have enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate if you can leave a like. And also, if you are new to my channel, do consider subscribing for more uh, videos. If this one ends up being popular, I'll probably make it a bit of a series. So do make sure to comment below if you are liking this series, because that tells me to, well, to make more videos like this one and to do some reporting on this tournament. Um, yeah, that's about all for me. Glad that you enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one. Get out of here.